today on Ask This Old House. Check out this big gap on the bottom of the door. I'm going to show you how to make it weather tight. The way you check a door to see if it's out of plumb is when you stop the door, it should stay in that position if it's plumb. If I let the door go and it falls in to the space, it means that it's leaning into the house. We're testing out some of the latest battery-powered wand tools. Woo! And I'll teach you the do's and don'ts to clean your paintbrushes. Oh, please, don't do that. That's next on Ask This Old House. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House where we love getting your questions. And in fact, we got one from Jerry in California. And Jerry wrote us, would you recommend using a battery operated lawnmower to replace a 30 year old gas mower? Well, Jerry, that's a good question and I know just the guy with the answer. Cute little guys, huh? Hey, Jen. Hey, Roger. Hi, Kev. Hi. Okay, so fresh out of the mailbag for you, Roger. Jerry in California wants to know whether it's time to give up on his gas lawnmower and switch to battery. Previously, we've always made that judgment based on square foot of the yard. If it was small, you could get away with a battery. If it was big, the batteries tended not to run long enough mm. to do the whole yard. So for professional situations. It wouldn't work for me at all. Yeah. But They've improved the batteries a lot now. So what I'd like to do is get a bunch of these together, take them out, put them through their paces, and let's see how they do. Can I come with you? Of course. <laughs> Look All at right. you too. All right. Hey, how about that, Jerry? Right? You ask, we answer. All right, go get them. All right. Let's go. Do it. Hey, Waldemar, how are you? Hi, Tommy. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. It's a great old house, but it's a busy street. Yes, it is a little bit. Well, show me what you have. Come on in. Oh, look at this. A work in progress. I feel like I'm at one of my job sites. Yeah, thank you. I'm trying to keep the dust away from the living room. Oh, yeah. I know that trick well. And this stairs. Who's doing all the work on the stairs? Uh, it's actually me and my wife, you know, trying to fix it. Good for you. Well, you got it all screwed off and glued off. That's not going to squeak. What are you doing with the floorboards? It's reclaimed floors from this house. So actually, we're trying to salvage as much original parts as possible. So you're going to use those on the treads and stuff? Absolutely. Paint up the risers. Hopefully, it'll look good. Great. Well, the stairs are the ultimate challenge. And my hat's off to you for attempting it. It looks like you're doing a good job. Well, thank you. But I got a way bigger challenge than that. And it's actually this door. This front door? Yeah. OK. What's the problem? Oh, boy, look at the carvings. This is a nice door. Well, we're trying to save it for that very reason. Uh, we think it's beautiful and probably original to the house, but the draft is just killing us. The draft? Well, yeah, it looks like you have a little bit of a gap on the bottom there. I think we took about four layers of previous floors, and then we put uh, one more layer. But because of that, it created that gap. Oh, I see. So when you open the door, yeah, oh, I see. It's because there was four layers on there, they had to cut the door to uh, make it open or let it open. Wow. Right now, we have the temporary strip over there, but you can really feel the draft coming in. Yeah. Well, I think the door is beautiful, but just looking at it real quickly, I would say it's probably not original to the house. Really? Yeah. It's too thick for this jam. The door should be flush or inset slightly to the jam. I see. All right, but if you're up for it, I'll go get some tools and we can fix this. Let's do it. All right. All right, now the first thing I notice when I come up to the door is this big gap on the bottom. On this side, it's about an inch and an eighth. On this side, it's about an inch and a quarter. We need to fix that. The other thing is, is I know that the door is too thick for this jam. And lastly, it's also out of plumb, and I can see that. The way you check a door to see if it's out of plumb is when you stop the door, it should stay in that position if it's plumb. If I let the door go and it falls in to the space, it means that it's leaning into the house. I All right. See. Now, to fix that, I need to know how far out of plumb it is. The easiest way to do that is with a plumb bob. And this is nothing but a weight on a string. So I just attach it to the top of the door. Pull the string out, let the plumb bob steady, 
Now we check it. Now the first number I need is this one right here. It's just 2 and 7 sixteenths. I then go down to the bottom with 3 and 11 sixteenths. So that tells me that I need to take an inch and a quarter out of the top of the jam down to nothing. I see. All right, to get started, why don't you start removing that weather strip? Now we're going to measure in an inch and a quarter at the top and snap a chalk line down to nothing at the bottom and remove all that material. And that will make this side of the jam plumb. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. All right, because we moved the stop of that rabbit out further, we now have to adjust the mortise of our hinge on the inside to meet the same dimension as we have on our door. Okay. We want to make it just a little bit thicker, so I'm going to adjust my scribe right there and allow about a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, so now I'll just transfer that to our jam. Take my scribes, hold it against the stop of the jam, and trace it down. That's how far we have to move this mortise in. I see. Okay, let's try the door, see how it closes. All right, closes good, seats right up against the jam nicely, all the way around. Wow, what a difference, Tommy. Okay, Looks great. now we're gonna deal with that space on the bottom. All right, this is the weather stripping that we're gonna install on the bottom of your door. It's actually an automatic weather stripping. So when you install it and the door closes, this little pin right here hits the jam. When the door closes, it pops the weather stripping down, filling that gap. Oh, that's beautiful. Now normally, this would slide up into a dado that we would make on the bottom of the door, making it flush on the bottom. Mm -hmm. This coincidentally happens to be an inch and an eighth high, and your door is an inch and an eighth away from the threshold here, but an inch and a quarter away from the threshold here. Okay. So we have to cut an eighth of an inch off of this side for the clearance that we need to close when the door closes. I see. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a piece of wood on each side of the door to create our own dado. And it's going to cover the aluminum. It's going to hide it. And we're also going to lengthen the door. Makes sense. I want to make the glue joint strong, so I put two rabbit cuts on each side of the door before I add my filler pieces. All right, while we're waiting for the glue to dry on our filler strips, let's install the weather stripping around our door here. Okay. Okay, now we can reapply the weather stripping you had, or I actually like this weather stripping right here. 
It's actually a silicone-based weather stripping that will fit right into a dado, right where the rabbet is made tight in the corner. If you look on the weather stripping, there's actually like a T-shaped barb right there. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, so what we need to do is cut a dado right down there to match the shape of that. How do you do that? Well, we have a router right here with a V base that fits tight into the corner. And the bit is an eighth inch bit, but at the top is a T shape that will give us a dado with a T inside, so that will lock into it. The gaps between the door and the jam is different on the three sides. So I'm gonna have you use a smaller weather stripping on the hinge side and a thicker one on the top and striker side. This will prevent the door from over compressing the weather stripping so it will last longer. Once the glue is set, I can cut my fellow pieces to length and width and give everything a good sanding. These score marks will help the filler pieces blend in with the styles and rails. Now we can install the channel and the weather stripping. Then rehang the door. Okay, get that top pin. To me a little bit more. There it is. Okay, good. More to me. There it is. Okay, good. and I added this plastic push pin so the head of the screw won't dent the jam. We also moved out the striker, so now the door should come right tight against the weather strip, and why don't you give it a try? There you go. Wow, what a difference. Nice and tight. Now, once you get this door painted up, you'll never know that we made it longer. A brand new old door. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. My pleasure. Thanks for your help. Now you can watch This Old House and Ask This Old House anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. All right, Tommy, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Chiseling the entire length of the jam, really? Well, it's just to show the homeowner that you can do that whole work by hand. And that's the way we used to do it years ago. Yes. But, you know, you can set up a straight edge with a trim router and a yeah. following bit, and it's come right down along that and then trim it out nice and straight. But no matter what you do, you're still going to have to finish it off at the top corners and across the bottom with a chisel. Although I was thinking oscillating saw, although I, mean, I guess that's kind of a rarefied tool for a lot of people as well. Yeah, I mean, that's another big investment if you're going to just go into one door. Right. Yeah. Speaking of rarefied tools, come on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A router with a cornering jig. I love this Made thing. for weather stripping. Yeah, I have, I, I have one, and I got to say, you know, you don't use it all the time, but when you use it, it's magical. It's 90 degree base. It's got a T at the router bit. So. Yeah, so that idea of the T, what is it? So it actually, even though you drill the hole in, when you zip it along, it yeah. creates something for that barb to pop mm -hmm. into? Yeah, that barb is actually T. So when it goes into the hole, it's, it flattens out, and then yeah. once it's in there, it snaps out, and so now it's harder to pull it out. Right. Now, you, you could have, if you don't have this, you can go with the alternative obviously, which is yeah. just putting a bead in there and you know, adhering a, right. a flat but th weather strip. This company sells a variety of sizes because you have to make sure you have the size right with the gap, but they also have another option where you can buy it just as a tube. Oh, I see. All right, and so then if you take the tube, you can, you can run a bead of adhesive right into the, the rabbit there and stick it in place. Yes. If you have to change it though, then you pull it out and you gotta remove all the adhesive and then redo it. With this, I can just reach in, pull it out, and put another one in. So if this wears out in five or 10 years, it's an easy fix easy once fix. you've gone through this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly why I, I thank you so much for giving me this. <laughs> you know? Well, I'll let you borrow it. I don't know if you can handle it. 
All right, Mauro, earlier this year, you were telling us how to pick a good brush, and the takeaway was buy the most expensive brush you can afford. Get a good brush. And people took you up right. on that advice, but now they want to protect that investment. So how do we keep those expensive brushes clean? Very simple. There's a lot of people out there using wrong ways to clean brushes. Hmm. They use vinegar. They use additive, chemicals. It all don't. All right, keep it simple. So keep what is the simple. process? The process is very easy. It's all start with your paint. Don't load up your brush more than you need to. Okay. The true finger is the way to go. Just dip your brush. So less is more, huh? Less is better and more. Right. This way. And then from here, we're going to clean this brush right away. Immediately after your paint is done, start to clean. Always the right side up. <clears throat> Work with your fingers on into the bristles. All you need is warm water. If you need to, a little soap. Okay. That's all you do. And look at you, just sort of working it with your fingers, massaging it out there. Just give it a little massage, push this paint off from in from the ferrule. And one important tip, Kevin, never turn your brush upside down. Really? Because you are forcing the water underneath the ferrule, which is going to get clogged with the paint and the brush is ruined. Oh, please, don't do that. Although you would, I mean, I could see, I mean, it sort of opens up all the bristles. You are damaging the brushes right there. That's not good, huh? Not, not good. And I'll show you why. All right. Here's what I got here. Look at you with your cutaways. I got two brushes, a brand new one and a bad one. So here's the ferrule. Here's the ferrule. And that's a clean one on the left. That's a clean one here. This is the ferrule. This is the uh, epoxy that holds the filaments together. Yeah, look at all this. And there's a little spacer right in between that. So is that what I was doing right there? I was actually taking any residual paint up here and the water was just pushing it down here. You force it, the water and the paint underneath the ferrule. That causes the bristles to get damaged. All right, I'll never do it again, I promise. <laughs> okay, so eventually you are going to get some paint on the ferrule, some left over right here. What are your thoughts on wire brush and metal comb? Wire brush is not good at all. Never? It, it, never. You're going to damage the, the, the ferrule and also you're going to damage the bristles. Too aggressive. Too aggressive. How do you feel about the comb? Oh, the comb, only if it's necessary. But what I like to do, if there's still some paint back here, hmm. I use a scrub pad. Just nice and gentle and remove the remaining paint on it. So even less aggressive. Less aggressive. Boy, you are hardcore. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that's why your brushes look like this. So what about drying? What do we do to dry? We'll give it a cap, you know, get this nice and fluffed rag couple dabs mm -hmm. and use your hands. Your hands just do the job just fine. Yeah, Let's give it a cup better. of spin. Yeah, I can feel a little droplets yeah. coming off there. So that's clearly working. Nice. See? Bristles are fluff up. Back place again. Yep. This is how you do it. Okay. Like okay. It. And now after the brush is dry, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna storage. Storage. Every high quality brush it comes with a good cover. Mm -hmm. And this one here the size of the, the cover matched with the size of your paint brush. Sure, comes with it. Comes so with this it. one's a tapered brush, so the cover's tapered. This one's two and a half inches, same two for the cover. Two and a half inches. Velcro, tied up, and the brush is good to go again on the next job. I love it. Great tips tomorrow, thank you. Thank you. Hey Roger, what'd you find? Well Jen, I was poking around the storeroom and I found a string trimmer, chainsaw, another chainsaw, and a hedge trimmer and they're all electric, they're all powered by a battery. So you mean no mess, like no oil, no spark plugs, no gas, no air filters, no changing maintenance? Yeah, they are pretty powerful little things, I have to give them that much. But the thing is the manufacturers all make different size batteries, so this one wouldn't fit into this chainsaw. But you may need three or four different pieces of equipment to do the work, and each one of those pieces of equipment needs a separate type of battery. So you'd have a lot of batteries around. Because the brands are not interchangeable. Not at all. All right. But I want to show you a new line of tools that's going to keep you busy all four seasons. Let's go check it out. Jen, this manufacturer has enough tools to do all the work you can think of around your yard. And they're all charged by this lithium battery, 40 volt battery. So this one battery is interchangeable between all of these tools? That's right. You've seen Tommy change a battery when he goes from a drill to a saw? Yeah. Same idea. They all fit into the equipment now. That's fantastic. Here's a lawnmower. 
In this case, it requires two of those batteries. So you just lift these and pop them in? Yep, that's all there is to it. Now it has an adjustment for the height, so we can make it as high or as low as we want to do what we want to do. So you could adjust the heights for the grass? Yep, now you've got a safety switch here and a handle. Start it up. Let me get my ear protection. So, what do you think? It's pretty awesome. Well, it's got a 20-inch blade, so it's not going to do much damage to our backyard, but for a homeowner in the city or something like that, it'd be perfect. A suburban lot? I mean, this is very simple to use. Yep. We'll pop that battery out for me. What we're actually going to do is bring it over here. So we're going to lift this up, pull this out. There's plenty of juice left in it, so we are going to use it on our string trimmer. Can you push that right through there? And this is where the interchangeable part right, comes in. Look at okay. that. And I'm going to trim all along this wall. Once you're done with the trimmer, you can take and pop the battery out and put it into a leaf blower. Now you can use it to either clean up a walkway or blow the leaves off the lawn. Now in the spring, before you start planting, it's always nice to rototill the beds and loosen up all the soil. Right. We even got an electric rototiller with the same battery that's going to do that for us. That's very handy. Now, they make a couple different types of saws. This is a 12-inch saw. This would be perfect in a suburban lot, really a small setting. Right, but they also make a 14 and 16, and that would cut down a decent-sized tree. Right. Now, you have to remember that any saw, even with the, with the electric, you have to lubricate the blade, so you have to put bar oil in these, but not mixed with gas, just bar oil. So just a tiny bit of yeah. maintenance. Yep. That's fine. And what I really like is behind you here, this pole saw. Look at that. There is always a branch that's too high to get to. And rather than climb up a ladder and reach, you can simply take the pole saw up and cut it off. Now here's another tool that I haven't used yet. It's a snow blower and I haven't had any snow. So when it comes, we'll give it a shot, see how it works out. Well, it's a perfect size too for sidewalks and decks and oh, walkways. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. In tight spaces, it'll work really well. Take a look at this wheelbarrow. This is a wheelbarrow? Yeah, it has a hydraulic lift to help you dump it. And just take and put it back. Talk about back safety. Here we go. Wanna hop in? Seriously? Go ahead. You gonna give me a, okay, let's go. Where are we going, is it gonna hold me? <laughs> there you go. Are you even pushing? No, I'm not pushing at all. It's a big hill here, you know. Yeah. Oh man, what is that? This is a riding lawnmower. Get out of town. It's a battery powered one. All the other stuff we looked at, it had a battery you could take in and out. This one's an electric car, so the battery is fixed inside. So it's a charger? Yep, you plug it in, charge it up. It's just like a golf cart. It is. It can work for two hours or cut up to two acres, and then it needs to be recharged. next time on Ask This Old House. If you're ready to install your own faucet, I'm gonna show you some cool wrenches you might wanna know about. Live edge tables like this are really popular right now and we'll show you how to build it. This is maple and I open it up like a book. You can see the grain is a book match. And in Future House, I'll take you to a community in Texas that promises to bring renewable technology to the masses. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.